Hi and uh, welcome to At Home With The Grand. Um, got another photography video for you here and what I want to do today is talk to you about tripods. So a tripod is what it says it is, basically a, th a three-legged tripod on which you can put your camera to keep it steady and stable. Now tripods come in all different shapes and sizes, that's my little mini tripod. Right down to a super lightweight pencil type tripod, this could literally fit in your pocket but it does its job of being a tripod holding the camera steady. Okay, And obviously you can go from the sort of professional carbon fibre, heavy duty tripods that I use professionally, but you don't, you, know, you don't need to use a tripod like this. I mean look at something here, very affordable, very lightweight, see how easy this is to carry around, this sort of thing you can buy on Amazon, any photo store, not particularly expensive. But all you're trying to do is keep that camera steady and when it's set, in position. So the first great advantage of a tripod is from a composition point of view. If you are looking for a really accurate, careful composition, a tripod's going to allow you to do that. It really slows your photography down, makes you think about what you're photographing and studying how you're going to compose that picture. And then it's set, so you can even walk away from it, look around, and the camera's still set in that position. So that's a great advantage of a tripod. But the other main reason we use a tripod is by keeping it steady, that means we can then use longer exposure times. So if you remember in the other video when we talked about the way we control the exposure in a camera with two things, the aperture, the size of the hole that allows the light to form the sensor, bigger the hole, more light, smaller hole, less light, and the shutter speed. So if you use a very fast shutter speed, like a thousandth of a second, it lets very little light in. Whereas with, if you use a one second exposure, it lets lots of light in. But obviously, if you're gonna hold the camera in your hand, you can only use certain shutter speeds. And you tend to find from a 60th of a second and higher, you can hold quite easily in your hand. But once you get down to shutter speeds of one second, two seconds, quarter of a second, you really need a tripod or something to support the camera. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, hold a minute, when we're indoors in different situations, our cameras or our camera phones are allowing us to photograph handheld in all these environments. And yes, they are. But it's another automatic system on your camera. Now, sensitivity of your sensor is, is gauged by something called ISO. It's like a number, it's like feet or meters or whatever. It's the number for the sensitivity. So what most cameras have is auto ISO. So as you go from a bright exterior to a dark interior, it obviously knows that if the shutter speed goes below, below say a 60th, you're not gonna be able to hold the camera steady. Therefore, you're gonna get something called camera shake and your photograph's gonna be blurred. And the only way it can solve that is either by using a flash, if it's got a flash built in, so then it's no longer using the light in the room, or if it's using the light in the room, the natural light, let's call it, it's having to increase the sensitivity of the sensor to allow you to continue to use that short shutter speed that you can hold in your hands. And that's a great system. It's a great way of solving the problem. But what happens as you increase the sensitivity or the ISO number, say up to, a thousand ISO or two thousand ISO, you start to lose quality in your pictures and you get a thing what we call in digital photography noise, what we used to call in the film days grain. It starts to break the image up and you lose quality and also you lose colour depth as well too. It's caused by the signal ratio in your digital cameras, it's boosting that, it just can't get the same quality. So if you're shooting interior pictures, for instance, like at the Grand Theatre with all this beautiful detail of, of the matching architecture, you want the best possible quality from your digital file. And by lowering the ISO, you'll get the best quality. But that may mean we need a much longer exposure time. Therefore, we have to put the camera onto a tripod or support the camera so the camera is steady and then it can use these very long exposure times. And let's face it, if you're photographing architecture, interiors, landscapes, lots of different scenes when nothing is really moving within the scene, there's no reason why you can't use a longer exposure time and you get much more quality to your pictures, much more colour depth, particularly detail in shadowy areas because this is where when you up the ISO in your camera, the shadow area can get very noisy and can really affect what you're trying to do in the picture. It can be quite disappointing. So by using that lower ISO, you can get that quality and the tripod will allow you to do that. And remember, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't have to be a tripod. I mean, 
you can just rest the camera on a surface. You take my Hasselblad here, I raise it on the desk here, and it's still stable. Um, a lot of people I know use bean bags. If you're going in a church interior abroad somewhere, you're in a nice church, you want to get a shot of it, just rest it on a pew or get a bean bag just to level the camera. And depending on the exposure time, if it's not too long, you might be able to just hold it, bracing it against something. If the exposure time is getting longer, maybe a second or beyond, then you could maybe use a self-timer because most cameras, nearly every camera, has a built-in self-timer where when you press the button, there is a so many second delay before it actually takes the photograph. So you can press the button, step back from the camera, and it will take the photograph for you. Okay? So it's giving you another creative, like we've been talking about throughout, another creative to the tripod's giving you that option to do certain things. Now, don't get me wrong, there's going to be loads of situations where a tripod's not right for what you're doing. But for some sorts of photography, it's going to work really well. And it's also going to make you more careful about your compositions, I think, in your photography, and slow you down a little bit. Think about what you're actually photographing. So let's just touch back on that ISO and the auto ISO, because like we've talked before about auto exposure and auto white balance, most cameras have auto ISO, which helps them, phones do this all the time, to deal with the light situation. It knows the light level's dropped. It has to keep that shutter speed to a certain uh, speed so you can hold it steady. It's opened the aperture as wide as it can so it can't let any more light in that way. So when it's stuck between the shutter speed and the widest aperture, it then has to go to ISO to raise the ISO automatically so at least you're not going to get a blurred picture. So again in your menu or in the dials, usually in the menus with auto ISO, you need to turn the auto ISO off and then it will show you all the different film speeds your camera has and you can make a decision which one you want to use. And again, this depends on your camera, the sophistication of the camera. Some cameras, you know, up to four, eight hundred thousand ISO is still really nice quality, really nice quality. But it will always be better with those lower numbers. And again, some cameras might not be quite as good at doing those high ISO, so work even better at the lower ISO numbers. OK, so you take it off and you make a decision about that number. Now, that's something you need to do when you capture the picture. Even if you shoot raw, as we've talked about before, it's not going to let you change the sensitivity afterwards. OK, so you need to make that ISO decision when you're taking the photograph. That makes a difference yeah, to that situation. So like I say, you can look at all different tripod solutions. I mean, there's the little gorilla ones, the little bendy ones. You've probably seen them with the bendy legs. You can even wrap them round. You know, they'll, they'll sit as a tripod and let the bends, let the legs bend you around things. You know, it might be a, an edge on a table which you can just grab around or a tree in a park and the legs will even... So there's lots of different solutions about holding the camera steady. It doesn't have to be this size a tripod, but if you're keen, you want to move on, maybe you could go down that route and go to that level of thing. So, I think that covers what we're saying about the tripod and how we can use it in different ways and also about the ISO side of things, so how you can work on that. And remember, when you go onto the manual ISO, another thing I recommend trying to do is have a little play with your different ISOs on your camera. Photograph a scene at 200 ISO, 400 ISO, 800 ISO, maybe 1200 ISO. Do all your different ISOs the camera's offering you, the same scene. And then when you get back to base and you have a look at those images, maybe on your computer or your tablet or whatever, compare the different ISOs with your particular camera and see what you're happy with. I mean, you might like the look it gives you, you know, at certain positions. So have a play with that. And you might be happy with that quality at that certain ISO. So when you go out shooting stuff and you haven't got a tripod and you are going to push the ISO, you're aware of what the, um, your particular camera is going to give you. The other thing just to touch on with a tripod as well is think about creative blur techniques because when your camera is static, if you were photographing an interior scene, say with a, with a dancer in it, you know the scene because you're on the tripod will be all perfectly sharp, but if the dancer's moving while you're doing a longer exposure, maybe a quarter of a second or an eighth of a second, you get some nice blur in the subject. So you can get some nice creative blur effects. You've probably seen it at racetracks with race cars when you're following them. If you again set a slightly longer shutter speed and track move your camera with the car, you can keep the car nice and sharp and the background blurred. That's something you'll need to practice, but it's another way of using those capabilities within the slightly longer shutter speeds that we're talking about. Well again, thanks for watching through the video. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send them through. 
uh, give likes and shares for at home with the grand and um, we look forward to seeing you at the grand hopefully sometime in the near future thank you very much <laughs>